Okay. So let us jump towards the, the end of the Parsha first, because I do think, I'm sure we've talked about it in the past, but it's important methodologically to address uh, this issue. So, towards the end of the Parsha, we hear about the sin of Reuven. Um, right? Vayi Bishkon Yisrael Ba'aretz Ahi, Vayelech Reuven, Vayishkav et Bilha Pilegesh Aviv, Vayishma Yisrael, Vayahu Vene Yaakov Shnei Matar. So, Reuven went and he lay with Bilha, the Pelegesh of his father. Yisrael heard. And the children of Yaakov are twelve. Right? And the children of Yaakov are twelve. That is the next word, which everyone notes is weird. Um, so what exactly happened in this story? So, the reason I think we should talk about it is because most people... As soon as they read the story, what is their reaction if they grew up in any Jewish day school? He didn't do it. Right? Anyone who says that Reuven sinned makes a mistake. Right? Quoting the um, the Gemara in Shabbat Dafnun Hay, the position of Rishmuel Bar um, which is part of a litany of positions that he has, that anyone who says Reuven sinned is mistaken, anyone who says that David sinned with Bathsheba is mistaken, anyone who says that Chafni and Pinchas, the sons of Eli sinned, is mistaken, and he just keeps going, right? All these people, if you think it means what it says it means, you are wrong. Um, and that's the position that Rashi follows, right? That this can't possibly mean what it says it means. It can't mean that, that Reuven slept with Bilhah because um, following the, the, the Gemara, what does he say? Um, what he did was that he, right, you've probably heard this, right? What, what does Rashi say? Please tell me. Rashi just says that when Rachel died, Yaakov had moved his primary tent to Bilha and made her the main wife. Reuven was insulted on behalf of his mother. And he therefore moved around the beds so that the main bed would be in Leah's tent and that intrusion into, um, into Yaakov's uh, personal life, intimate life, is considered terrible and that's why it's as if he slept with her. Um, and the, the, uh, the proof that Rashi brings from that Gemara is that the next few words, which are sort of strange, is Vayuvene Yaakov Shnei Matar. Yaakov's sons were 12. What do you mean Yaakov's sons were 12? So Rashi says, Matchil Le'inyan Rishon, Mishon Le'inyan Rishon 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 Le'inyan so, the first methodological point that we have to make, and again, I may have made it last year, but I'll make it again because I see from the blank look that even if I said it last year, it was forgotten. <laughs> it's just fine. Um, is that, let's focus on this position, okay? There's a few important points to make about this position, right? The variations on it, that Reuven did not commit adultery with his father's wife. First, is that you might hear people say that is the traditional position, right? And therefore, any other position is non-traditional. Right? You must accept this position, right? And they say that about Ruvain. They say that about about David, right? By David, that's the right. The, David is the real one where people get really worked up about this, right? You say that David committed adultery and had someone's husband killed, and they'll say, "Call Omer David right? It's wrong, David." It, David is the father of Mashiach, David is a tzaddik, can't be, right, Chazal say he didn't have it, that's not traditional. So first thing to note is that it is presented as a machloket in the Gemara. It's not presented as the unanimous position in the Gemara, it's presented as the position of Shmuel Bar who consistently reads this into David's story, Ruvain's story, Chafni and Pinchas, etc. So the first thing to know is that it is not the traditional position, it is a traditional position, which appears in Chazal and is accepted by Rashi, which makes 
people think that this is the traditional position, but it's not the traditional position, it's a traditional position. And even when Chazal, what? Fine, I'm not saying it's not a very traditional position, and maybe following Rashi that many people who are more Midrashic oriented will take this as the, as the position. That's fine. But the first thing to note is don't, right, it's not true to say that this is the position. It's a position, an important position. But it's not the only position. That's first. Second point is that people misunderstand, I think, what the Gemara even means when it says, Kol Omer, Ruvain, David, Chafni, Penchas, Chata, Rebbe Eli, Chata, Eino, Elotoe. It does not mean they did not sin. That is an absurd position. Why do I know that's an absurd position? Yeah, because God said they sinned, they got punished for it. In the case of David, his punishment was quite extreme, right? In the case of Reuven, it's not totally clear what he was punished with, but in Divrei Hayamim, it implies that this is the reason he lost the Bukhar, right? and it was given to Yosef, was because of this act. It seems to say that. So there is punishment. So the Torah says they sinned, and there are consequences. Right? By David, this is very clear. David says, Chatati. Right? David says, I sinned. So anyone who says, oh, David never sinned, is denying what David himself said, what the Navi said in the name of God, leaves the consequences completely unexplained as to why they would be punished. So if that's the case, then what does it mean when you say, Kala Omer, David, Ruvain, B'nai Eli, Chata, Eina, Elotoa? What, what does that mean? If it doesn't mean they didn't sin, what does it mean? And we have to be careful here. Well, maybe they were forgiven, though they do get punished pretty badly, and Reuben doesn't, it's not clear how much he's forgiven for it. But that they sinned, maybe not in the exact way it sounds in the Torah, meaning it's not as bad as it sounds, but you can't escape the fact that the Torah chose to tell you that Reuben sinned in a way that makes it sound like he committed adultery with his father's wife, which is pretty bad. Right? And therefore, this Midrashic position can't mean they didn't sin. Obviously they sinned. Not only did they sin, but clearly it was a terrible sin. What this position is telling you is that for a person of the stature of David, Ruvain, etc., what they did, which was not as extreme as it sounds, is philosophically speaking, theologically speaking, as bad as if they committed these terrible sins at their level, which means it's still pretty bad. Right? No one's saying that they didn't sin. Of course they sinned. The Torah said they sinned. So, okay, I see it's already eight minutes. So let's just focus on this position. Maybe we'll do the other positions on Tuesday. Okay, but then what is this position mean? What, what exactly does this position mean? If that's what it means, right, then what does it mean? In what way is this as bad as sleeping with his father's wife? Right? What is the Torah getting at if all he did was move around the bed and so what does it mean? Now, you could just say, well, he intruded into his father's intimate life, and that's terrible. Right? But I'll be honest that that doesn't seem to me as egregious a crime as adultery in any way, shape, or form, that I don't even understand how you could present that as he committed adultery. Right? I mean, that's weird. I mean, okay, so he involved himself in his father's intimate life. He moved around the bed. I mean, okay. I mean, that's bad. Right, or whatever. In some Mepharshim, he slept in Ruvain, he slept in Bila's tent to prevent Yaakov, sorry, in, yeah, in Bila's tent to prevent Yaakov from coming in, but he never actually, right, had sex with her. He just slept there, right? We have to be explicit. If we're using the euphemisms, we're very unclear here, right? Okay, that's even more of a intrusion into his intimate life, but still, that's not an adultery. So I think, and I've, I've heard this from several sort of modern thinkers, but I think it's, it's true, and this emerges from W.C. Hoffman as well in certain ways, is that in Tanakh, the act of sleeping with a father's wife is what? Right? What is the main crime there? So it seems to not just be a sex crime. Right? It's not just one of the Arayot. It's a power play. Right? The paradigmatic case is 
of Shalom, when he wants to have a coup against his father, he sleeps with his father's wife. He sleeps with the wives of, of David. Right? Now, that's clearly not because he had an intense sexual desire for each and every one of his father's wives. Right? It's because he's trying to show that he's now king. Um, and therefore, in addition to the sexual component of this thing, Right, part of what makes it so egregious is this claim right, that I can replace you as the head of the family, as the patriarch. And I think that what Chazal are getting at is even if all he did was choose or attempt to choose who would be the next main wife, right, that is an attempt, that is right, an assertion of his place as uh, the head of the family, that he gets to choose. And in that sense, it's like sleeping with his father's wives. Right? He is trying to determine the course of the family, not Yaakov. And right, right, Salvechik points out something interesting. Is that if you read these, these uh, psukim, so you get, Vaisa Yisrael, Vayet Alom Ehalom Megaleder. Yisrael traveled and put down his tent. Vayhi Bishkon Yisrael Baratzai. And when Yisrael was dwelling in that place, Vayelach Ruvain, Vayishkavet Bilhap Lagesh Aviv. So Ruvain went and slept with his father's. Pilagesh, by Ishma Yisrael, and Yisrael heard, by Hubinay Yaakov, Shnei Masar, and the children of Yaakov are twelve. So the Rav said, Well, why do you have Yisrael three times? And then after this act, by Hubinay Yaakov, Shnei Masar. Right, so he argued that what's happening here is exactly what I just said is that the name of Yaakov that represents his weakness is Yaakov. Right, he only gets things through deceit. He held on to Akev Esav, he held on to his heel. He's a follower, right? He's weak, he can't, right? The, when we talk about Yaakov in his weak state, that's the name Yaakov. The name Yisrael represents Kisarita Elokim Vadam Vatuchal, that he can conquer. He can conquer the Malach, he can conquer Esav, he can stand up for himself. And what the Rav argues is that the Pasuk uses Yisrael three times, but after the sin of Ruvain, he reverts to Yaakov. Right? That this act of Ruvain asserting himself and taking his place, and even if you understand it the way the Midrash does, the way Rashi understands it, that he, all he did was assert that he wanted Yaakov's main wife to be Bilhah. Right? He's, all that progress that Yaakov has made to become Yisrael, to be the clear father of a nation, the patriarch, a powerful personality, and everything that comes with that, dissipated in a moment because Ruvain now asserted himself. Right? And now he's been a Yaakov, Shnei Masar. He's again Yaakov with all the, the implications of it. And the Rav argues that part of it, that that dynamic may be part of what created the sale of Yosef. Right? That once Yaakov is a we, is, right, once Ruvain basically makes it, the brothers don't view him in that status anymore. Right, they buy for power. Right, they 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 sideline Yaakov, and they try to assert control. That creates a dynamic that allows for a Yosef story to happen. That would never happen if you had a person that was still viewed as the powerful patriarch. Right, because that type of person you can't trick. That type of person gets to choose who his heir is. That type of person gets to determine the course of his family. But once Ruvain undermines that power dynamic and asserts himself as the patriarch, so now everything is, right, everything can be chaos, because now the brothers are going to be vying with each other for power, and therefore, if Yaakov was the clear leader of the family, then Yosef saying he's going to be king is no big deal. But if, the, but if Yaakov has been sidelined, and now the brothers are the ones that are supposed to take over, so then Yosef, having dreams to make it sound like he wants to lead, is a much bigger threat. And therefore, he argues that, that what the Midrash is getting at is that it was this dynamic that Ruvain created, where Yaakov is no longer viewed in that way, and that's really the problem, and that's what it's getting at. That it's that bad in the sense of this power play, and the consequence it has on the family. Okay, we'll talk about some of the other interpretations, I guess, later in the